Hey everyone and welcome to Invisible Not Broken. I have been waiting a while for this interview and you will absolutely find out why. If you um, go to our show notes, it's always the best thing to do is to go over to Invisible Not Broken and um, check out our show notes because I have everything linked. We are talking to an amazing author, Catherine Trueblood. I am going to be buying a lot of books. Um, this is absolutely what's going to happen. But we're going to be talking a lot about chronic illness and parenting from all the perspectives of those involved, which is a topic I am fascinated and living right now. So we're going to be discussing that. Her new book is called Take Daily as Needed, which, oh my gosh, great, great title visual. right here. And when you go over to our um, website, I'm going to have a little um, Amazon thing to click on. So you'll be able to instantly go right over to buy this book if you're like, you know what, this is my life right now. <laughs> I'm totally living this. So Catherine, welcome. I'm so excited to talk to you. Thank you. I, I, I feel honored to be on the show. <laughs> you are, yeah, you were, you were doing such a nice um, pep talk for me this morning. I really appreciated it off air. <laughs> Yeah, we need our pe- we need our pep talks. Those of us who are actively parenting and dealing with illness at the same time. It's, so, um, can you talk about what your? I, we're going to talk about what all of your family is dealing with and what your your inspiration behind the book was. But what are you specifically dealing with yourself? Um, I my first autoimmune disease uh, came when I was forty, and um, I had um, Graves' disease and had to have my thyroid removed. I couldn't sleep for about six weeks. And um, I had Crohn's uh, in 2007. Um, I was hospitalized with Crohn's. And, you know, to give you a a picture of my life, I was raising um, two children, one of whom has um, anaphylactic allergies to many foods. I uh, was um, making the climb to full professor, so trying to get tenure. Um, I was married and um, my husband at that time uh, professed to be a feminist, but he really didn't make the commitment to act as a feminist. And so he had had a 1950s mom and he just kind of reverted. And I realized when I got the first illness that I couldn't remain healthy and stay in the marriage. I couldn't take care of myself. And so... Um, you know, it, many, many uh, tough epiphanies. We tend to think of epiphanies as these wonderful things, but actually they can be <laughs> very hard in your life. Um, so um, my children are much older. The book that I've written, Take Daily as Needed, follows two children from the ages of um, four and eight all the way to, you know, 18 and 14. So there's, there's an arc there of um, how the children deal with the mother's illness, how everybody adjusts together, um, and what her life is like. That is an amazing amount of information and a lot to unpack, so I'm going to try. <laughs> there's a lot there. Um, yes. And I noticed a theme through all of your books, at least I think I might have noticed a theme. This is my um, my old grad school in English literature poking back up again. Yeah. But you see... English- yeah, all of us English majors are always looking for patterning. Um, you seem to really explore a lot of themes about what's the straw that breaks everything. Yes. And um, mm-hmm. I'm very interested in that, especially from a chronic illness perspective, where I think a lot of us try to um, be the healthiest gazelle just hopping across the plains, avoiding the lions, where we're just like, nope, we're healthy, we're healthy, it's all good, everything's fine. <laughs> how, how does that work for you? With the, You had a lot of, you called them epiphanies, but the straws that just broke everything. How did that manifest for you? What was what was the, the realization that stuff yeah. had to change? Yeah. Um, I had an extraordinary number of, a number of pressures in my life at the same time. And I remember when I was writing the novel thinking, I can't have a family have this many afflictions. And then I looked at my life and said, well, I did. I lived through this. Um, After I was diagnosed with Crohn's and was sick, my father had a traumatic brain injury. He fell. And so he lost his short-term memory and um, his ability to... Uh, control his impulses. So um, he spent through his entire retirement in four years um, ordering stuff online. (laughs) There was no way to stop it unless we wanted to take him to court, which was very ugly because he would have fought back. So um, he died penniless. Um, 
so that was going on in my life. My, um, I was dealing with my daughter's um, anaphylactic uh, reactions to nuts. People just think about the allergy itself, but you have to think about the psychological aspect for the child, which is she was fed pre uh, nuts uh, by accident at her preschool, after which she no longer trusted the adults in the world to keep her safe. And she decided she would quit eating as a way of uh, coping with this herself. So I was taking her to a trauma counselor. And um, my son is a wonderfully eccentric uh, young man. He's an artist and a musician. He never fit in convention. He wasn't interested in convention. And so teachers and people wanted to medicate him very early. Um, and so uh, I was dealing with going. So I had both children going to, you know, psychologists and therapists. And, um, and I went through a divorce um, at the same time. So... Um, yeah, there was just this, this fulcrum of events. Um, and I, I think the thing that I want, I, I wrote this book because I couldn't find a book like it. Uh, I wanted a book to really keep people company who are in that, what I call the chaos narrative, which is when you're first diagnosed, you don't know if you're going to be able to keep your job or not. That's very frightening, right? Well, I Disability want to kind of looks like right a, in there because yeah. uh, we are um, mm -hmm. both here in the U.S. And I know um, I've gotten clocked for this yeah. before, but this is an important point for any of you who live in socialized medicine countries. When she says mm -hmm. losing her job meant also losing all health insurance. That's what our jobs are tied. Our jobs here in the United States are tied to our health yeah. insurance. So if you do not have a job with health insurance, you have to pay. Uh, I think when I did that, it was over $1,000 a month. So just a real quick, like, this is why keeping your job, no matter what, is so important here in the U.S. Sorry, I didn't mean to interrupt. I just know that our international audience sometimes is like, wait a minute, why wouldn't you just quit your job? And that's, that's why. You find that people are dumbfounded when you explain to them the, the situation that you're left in. And then we have uh, disability itself. Um, you know, I had a friend with uh, MS, and um, one of the stories in the collection is really a tribute to her because um, – she didn't live after her. She, she, she was determined to live until her son graduated from high school, but she, she died not long after. But I saw her life, and I knew she went to the food bank. She lived on disability, and her life was very marginal. And so I was afraid of that when I was in this, this what I call the chaos narrative. That actually comes from um, a sociologist named Arthur Frank who wrote a book called The Wounded Storyteller, and he talks about what the master narrative is for illness versus what the real narrative is for illness. So, um, you know, in that very fearful, chaotic time, you don't know what medications are going to work. You don't know what your tools are. You don't know, um, you don't have faith or trust that you're going to get better. You know, you don't haven't learned the pattern of your own disease. So, um, if this particular character made too, it's really kind of, there's a lot of humor in the book. I love survival humor, but her, she's running her house like a, you know, it's like a halfway house for teens who, you know, are troubled or have run away or her son's friends or all these <laughs> teenagers. And sometimes they're kids who've run away because their parents are ill or not able to take care of them or are addicted. And so basically you have this single mother who's ill running a house full of teenagers and she's making good use of them, right? She's making them, you know, bring in the wood and bring in the groceries and go walk the dog. <laughs> so, yeah. um, so, you know, and, and they're funny and they and they keep her laughing. So I wanted to capture that. I love that you do that. Um, I feel like a lot of the, you know, if you're list, reading books that are a narrative of the, there's, this is everything going wrong, there's the forgetting of the humor. Like... I feel like that's yeah. a big way that most of us survive is the humor. And you obviously have a great sense of humor. <laughs> have to. <laughs> I don't think people understand how much that has to happen. If you if you need that laugh, it's it's imperative. Um, you said something in a few things. It just I'm seeing you're furiously writing notes. Um, I love the term the chaos narrative. <laughs> like that's that's one of my favorite yeah. phrases. Um, and you talked about your daughter, um, the trauma of disability and it's going to be a panel we're going to do soon is the um the trauma of medical intervention sometimes and the trauma with doctors how how does that go into your book do you 
I'm just, I, I haven't, I don't hear a lot of people talking about trauma when it's like, we should just be grateful to live. Like we, we shouldn't explore our, our emotions uh, when it comes to chronic illness and to trauma when things go horribly wrong. So I, I really am, um, I'm forming the question badly, but if you could talk a little bit more about trauma and chronic illness and that would be great. Yes. No, I, I'm happy to. Um, and, and there are connections there for me because, uh, I, um, also work with veterans um, I run storytelling workshops for veterans through um, the Red Badge Project in Seattle. And, and so I've thought a lot about trauma and trauma theory, but I will come back to uh, the child with anaphylactic allergies in my book, uh, who is loosely based on my daughter. Um, children can't talk about trauma, and so it's acted out. And um, my daughter would walk in front of, of, of moving cars. I'd have to, she would launch off the curb. Um, she would run straight into the waves, right straight into the waves at four years old. Um, she was, there was a part of her, I, I don't think it was a death wish, but I think it was this defiance, right? She had felt her own mortality. And so the way she responded to that was to try to act as though she were immortal in some ways. And then on the other end of it, you know, if she had a splinter in her hand, she would begin to cry and say, am I going to die? Mama, mama. In other words, there's, some, there's an artificial body in, in, you know, there's something in my body that shouldn't be in my body. Is it going to kill me? That was her response to um, having had terrible reactions in which, you know, in eight to 10 minutes, she would be in respiratory distress, her eyes would be swollen shut. Um, and then from these repeated, um, and we did the best we could, but you don't want to put your child in a bubble. So um, it's very hard to avoid so many things are, are so many foods are processed um, in factories that use nuts. And so cross contamination issues. Um, so I lived with a kind of hypervigilance and um, at one point ended up with a kind of post-traumatic stress myself where I remember being in a market and reading all of these labels that said may contain nuts, right, until it was finally may make you nuts, right? I, I, would, I would abandon my shopping cart and walk out. So um, there's a lot, there are a lot of psychological ramifications. Uh, um, I think that, that uh, people do get... Um, you know, white coat phobia, there are ways, you're, you're so vulnerable, you're so stripped down, especially if you've come into an emergency room to a hospital. Um, I think that um, you're not in a good place to advocate for yourself or stand up for yourself, right? So um, people do end up um, really marked by some of these experiences. You know, I, I could go on, but I'll, I'll take a breath. Take a breath. That's okay. Um, I do want to ask you, as you have such a unique position of being the daughter of someone who is going through a chronic brain injury issue and being the caregiver and the mother of, and then if I understood your questionnaire correctly, the wife of someone going through a mental health issue, and then you yourself have been on the, the other side. So you've had a perspective of almost every, every prism of this. What have you learned um, from being on, on all sides? Oh, I think, well, and I, I would say I'll say the most beautiful thing I can first, which is that I've learned a lot about the durability of love. Um, I've learned, um, I have tremendous faith in the kindness of people mm -hmm. towards each other. Um, so that, that's something that means a lot to me. Um, what I learned was that um, we live in a culture that values novelty, achievement, speed, effectiveness. It's this very kind of corporate managerial mindset. And if you're ill and chronically ill, uh, if you're dealing with physical or mental suffering, you have to live outside of that. And so I had to divorce my sense of myself from the constant need to achieve. Oh, wow. Um, yeah, yeah, and 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 you know I'm a professor, 
you know, as well as a writer. And so that world is very, very much about how much you've published and what are you doing next. And, um, and I had, you know, I remember having people say, what are you writing? And I just wanted to say the market list, you know, that's where I'm at. <laughs> that's what I'm writing this week. <laughs> so, um, and to make that okay for myself, um, I moved illness drew me towards Buddhism because, um, because Buddhism is about how you accept and respond to suffering, but it takes it as a kind of premise that life, you know, the first noble truth is that life involves suffering. Whereas I think Americans are very much about, we have the right to happiness. And if we don't have happiness, then we're going to take a pill or we're going to go on a vacation or we're going to buy a new car. We're going to do anything we can to make that suffering go away. And that doesn't enable you to live well with chronic illness, that, that outlook. So it, it changed me profoundly. Um, is that a good enough answer? That's for that? a phenomenal <laughs> answer. I, I, I don't ascribe to any particular religion, but I definitely felt like um, that chronic illness is the ultimate in like Buddhism of living in the moment because most of us with our chronic illness, there's not a steady trajectory or an absolute prognosis so we really have to live each second as as that second is whether it's good or bad we live on a wheel i say i walk i walk a circle of symptoms right and so i revisit these places it isn't this ascendant model of ever upward and onward you know into constant progress and achievement it's it's learning to walk that circle well and with some peace and uh, some compassion towards oneself. There is a book I love um, called How to Be Sick, uh, a Buddhist-inspired guide for the chronically ill and their caregivers. It's here. It's by Tony Bernard. Love I'll this put book. a link to that in the um, in the show notes as well. That's you are not the first okay. person to bring that book up. <laughs> yeah, that was it, you know, and I've looked at a lot of books. I have not found a helpful parenting book. You know, you might just have to write that. <laughs> I thought about it. <laughs> you might just have to do a nonfiction. That might be Maybe. something. I, exactly. You are so, like, like I said before, you're you're the person who's actually handled also um, as an adult child of a parent who's dealing with this. How is that different? Because it's one thing when we are parenting a sick child, but when we're the the child helping out with a sick parent, how did that right. differ for you? Oh, yes. Um, well, you, you really have to be concerned about your parents' dignity mm. at, because they're so aware of their own loss. My father had post-its all over his house, and um, I remember um, sitting with him at one point. Um, he had gotten himself in a real mess. He bought a condo for his girlfriend, kept his own condo, had no money in the bank, right? And he just ordered a $1,000 telescope. <laughs> and I was sitting with him. I sat down in front of his computer with him, and I said, Dad, you know, here's this bank account, here's this bank account, here are the two mortgages in arrears, here's the telescope. I said, why did you order the telescope? And he looked at me, and he was, he, he was at such a loss. And, and I took his hand, and he said, I don't know. You know, he didn't know. I think he just knew that for him, those Amazon boxes arriving at the back door, you know, that was that, that, was, that, was that moment of lift in the day. That was exciting. Something came for me. Oh, goody, right? And he couldn't stop himself. And here he was. You know, he was a, he was a surgeon, he was a smart guy, and he couldn't stop himself. So his sense of loss was, um, and his self-awareness of that loss was sad. It created a lot of pathos, you know, for us. And um, so I would say that that's one of the things that's very different. A child doesn't have that self-awareness of what they're losing, um, at least not to the degree that he did. You know, you, um, you talked before about, like, in America, how we're so not set up for, in our culture, dealing with chronic illness. And the Amazon buying, I think there's a lot of people who are hearing this who are like, 
Yes, I think I, <laughs> I didn't have a traumatic brain injury, but I hear that and I feel that I, yeah, yeah because it's, um, there's so few choices left a lot of the times when you're chronically ill and stuck at home. And these are choices that you can make. And these are breaks in your day where something special happens, that the package comes and it's a little excitement. I, I really um, hear that deeply. I would love to well, talk you're to you. are wise about what that is. You're really wise about what that is and recognizing what that is. And the other thing that's crazy when this was going on is I would open a closet and it would be full from floor to ceiling with the same computer, right? In other words, so he was calling Circuit City or wherever he was calling and they would let him order the computer over and over and over again. So we have, we have some real issues in terms of um, what's happening with, you know, our elder care and, um, the laws, of course, that we have. But I, I just thought, that is so wrong. You're taking such advantage of someone. And there are, and I know this, one of my friends is a geriatric nurse. You get situations where a spouse dies and the other one, particularly usually it's the woman who has not kept track of the finances and finds out that everything has been spent. There's been a mortgage taken out against the house or what have you. And she has no idea. I mean, we are, a lot of, this is happening a couple things are happening a lot. This is happening a lot. And then I'll just do a little tangent here. I don't know if you're aware, but in Bellingham, Washington, where I live in this last week, there was a murder suicide, mm -hmm. a 77 year old man and his 76 year old wife. And in his note, he cited medical costs. Uh, yeah. So again, you know, we're here in the U S um, a heart attack yeah. can bankrupt you here in the United States. It's not just, and I know though there's a lot of you with them. Yeah, I, I will go on this tangent. Um, I, go ahead and make your negative comments. That's fine. But I, I think it's very important for everyone to understand, keep understanding, especially those of you in the socialized medicine communities where you kind of get annoyed with that. That's okay. You can ask for better. That's fine. Here, um, cancer, uh, an accident, a breaking of the leg, anything can absolutely cost you your house here. This is not us over dramatizing anything. This is what's going on. Murder suicides for health costs is not that uncommon here in the United States. Suicide because of health costs is not uncommon here. So I just want to like, that's an important tangent. I just want to underline it a few times. When you hear these things on the news, we're not, we're not over dramatizing this. This is this is happening. Sorry, catch on the throat there. Um, because we've dealt, we haven't dealt with suicide here, but my family has certainly been impacted by the cost of of the yes. yes. It's um, it's brutal. My father is on treatment that if they did not, um, they're lucky enough to be of a different generation where they were able to get crazy level pensions for their work when they were working, and if he didn't have that, his cost for his ins was about twenty thousand dollars of treatment, and that was needed every three weeks for a while. So you could just imagine what that would have done to their savings as well. Um, yeah, sorry, that was that was an important little underline, um, very important underline. And you're right, as far as like how we take care of, of elders, you'd think that our um, AARP would step in and um, have laws about about how to protect someone without taking them to court. It's, it's really, a lot of the laws are very... Um, old and litigious. They, they didn't take into account that people don't have to leave the house to buy a whole bunch of things. Right. The fraud laws need to be updated and, um, yeah, there need to be some limitations on, or, or some sort of informed consent. If somebody's mm. ordering the same item over and over, you know, yeah. I, that's where my dark humor came in. I mean, my brothers and I going through his house, at one point we were both saying, where are the guns? We didn't know he had guns, right? Where are the guns? We found the ammo under the bed. Oh my we God. We found them up in, up in the loft with the skis. Anyway, it was just... That's that's a lot that, that we could we could unpack for a long time. Yeah, we, um, we I, won't. But anyway, I do want to... deals with this, this, you know, daughter and her father, and he was very powerful. My father would, had been a military captain, right? And so... He could call anybody up, and in 15 to 20 minutes, pretty much, um, he was he was just so so powerful in speech and voice and persona that he could intimidate them, mm. and they could, you know, so he kept passing every dementia test as all this is going on. Wow, that's that's amazing. <laughs> so, is this how yeah. you got involved in the Red Badge Project? Um. 
That's a really good question. I've been I've been thinking about that a lot. Um, there are a lot of reasons why. I I think that um, you know I'm, I'm I'm I've been in the classroom for 25 years. I teach at a state uh, university, Western Washington University. Um, a lot of the students in my classroom are military reservists. They are National Guard. They are uh, kids, often the first in their family to go to school. They're putting themselves through school. So um, in uh, 2001, when we um, went into um, the Middle East, when our wars there began, Operation Enduring Freedom, Operation Iraqi Freedom, I had students began disappearing out of my classroom. So for you know the military reservists, the National Guard, and then there was so much distress among their wives and sisters, and then there was this absolute disconnect because we have a volunteer army, unlike say World War II or Vietnam, when everybody knew somebody who was at, you know who was involved, right? So we had this profound disconnect where we had the privilege of not knowing. So you know those are kind of that's from the head, right? The political beliefs um, from the heart. Um, I do understand some things about mental anguish. Um, there's a fair amount of mental illness in my family. Um, I think people, there's a fair amount of trauma in my family, um, suicide. Uh, I felt that my writing and what writing gives me, which is my writing is a form of self-care that's profound. Mm. And I wanted to give that to other people. And I know storytelling um, is a way of healing and co at least coping because even if you can't uh, control what happened to you, right? That's traumatic experience. You things are happening, and you you have no control over them, and they're overwhelming you at every level. But but a narrative means that you you can control the narrative, and you can tell it any way you want, and you can give it any message that you want. And I found that to be enormously healing for me, and I see that to be a tool that's healing um, for other people. So I started working with the Red Badge Project. I actually started working just on my own um, at, at Western and in the veterans community up here. And I began running a storytelling um, performance. I would do workshops at the BFW, at the Bellingham Vet Center, and then we would come together um, and do a storytelling performance every year on campus. And then the Red Badge Project found out what I was doing, and I joined them. So, um, and, and the other thing I'm, I'm just, I am in awe of how much, um, these people show up for each other, um, the kind of loyalty that they have, the community that they have, um, and people do recover from mental anguish, you know, and these people also have a lot of dark survivor's humor. So I relate to them. I just do. And, you know, living in chronic pain, you know, a lot of them are living in chronic pain, whether it's mental or physical. A lot of them come back with physical pain and disability. And so it's all, you know, there's, there are a lot for me. There's just a lot of um, resonance there. I will never pretend that I know what it is uh, to have been in combat, but um, I feel I have something to offer them. What are some of the best ways you've seen people show up for each other in these in these writing workshops? Like, do you have any ideas of like the best ways for people? Because I think that's a, a big issue for a lot of us when we hear, even when we do have chronic illness, we don't necessarily know how to show up for another person when they say, you know, that they have a, a new diagnosis or they're suffering. Sometimes it's hard for us to know. Do you have any stories of, of how that's gone well? Yes. Um, I mean, I, deep listening it, it is a start, right? Mm -hmm. Just to have your story really, truly received by somebody else. And to, for us to resist the urge to fix it for someone, oh. and if you don't have that experience, <laughs> you oh. tell somebody, okay, you're feeling rotten or in pain or whatever, and they're like, oh, well, if you just do past life regression therapy, you'll be great. Or, you know, <laughs> I think we should remove the word just from our vocabulary when talking to people in okay. pain. Yeah. Sorry. <laughs> no, that's, that's good. I, I actually have scar tissue inside my mouth from like trying not to like rush into help. Like 
just biting onto the cheek. Like, especially mm-hmm. in parenting, I've noticed that one. <laughs> mm-hmm. It's very hard. No, I, I know. Um, I, I'm uh, guil- uh, guilty of that myself. So uh, I think that, I mean, maybe, and I don't want to divulge people's stories too much, but one of the most powerful things that happened was between a, a, a man who'd been a combat medic and an older woman who'd also been a combat medic, you know, and um, having to hold on to someone's face until it can be reattached mm. while that person is being moved in convoy. Those are, the, these, these are fierce stories. And for one person to be able to say to another, no, what you said was the right thing to say. What you did was the right thing to do. I don't know if you're with somebody, um, and they're dying in your arms and you say, you know, I've got your back. I'm going to take care of you. Was that the wrong thing to say because you knew they were dying? And another medic said, no, that wasn't the wrong thing to say. Because even if I've got your back, you know, I'm going to take care of you means that you're going to make sure all their parts get in a body bag and get back to their parents. Then you've done it. You've taken care of them. So this is like just this tremendous amount of, um, I would say they're able to to help each other resolve, absolve themselves of things that they feel, you know, they're carrying on their soul, and and so they they release each other, and um, you know, some nights I can't sleep afterwards, but I feel like so what, you know, these people have to live with these experiences forever, you know, I can I can handle it. So how do you, is you're not just a storyteller, you're also the holder of stories. How do you filter and process and make sure that you're also, I'm sure there's a lot of caregivers right now who are listening to this going, yes, I'm dealing with a lot of emotional trauma coming at me all day. How do you, how do you process all these stories and hold them for people, but still take care of yourself? Mm-hmm. Um, yeah, that, and that is still a work in progress. It's still a work in progress for me. Um, I try to make sure in my teaching that there's always an arc um, and that after we've done some of the really deep work that we end on, um, we end by thinking of how we are comforted and how we offer comfort to others and what are the wishes that we make for those we love and what are the wishes that we make for ourselves. I try to really, I talk about the process that you need to bring yourself back to a good place, right? Just like, I've stopped behaviors. I don't write until two in the morning anymore, right? Well, those, that was me in my twenties, right? Writing and drinking till two or four in the morning. Yeah, then it's so strange and weird, and there's no one to talk to, and you know, I mean, there's so there are practices of taking care of yourself. And very few of us so, can write Hemingway style into our forties. Like that's that's a young person's anybody, game, right? I mean, come on. And then his family. You don't want to. No, it's not a. I, I really had to, and you know my practice of my practice of I have a meditation group um, I have a spiritual center uh, that I'm part of um, which is also very much about um, catching yourself at what your inner monologue is and what you're how you're thinking and um, so there, there's a lot for me of self-compassion and self-care I teach these workshops six weeks at a time followed you know so by performance, so I'm not teaching them all the time. I think that's important. These are, these are, I think, short stretch and then a breather and then I can do it again in order to stay balanced. It sounds like a lot of what you are able to do is know your limits on that. Um, you, you can't just keep giving everything all the time and finding the internal, internal balance. Well, but you have to remember that I am somebody who was so overextended and so multitasked back in 2007 when I had felt sort of fell out of the sky into a hospital in Philadelphia at the end of a book tour. I was a, I was a mess. And the way I was living had no self-care in it at all. And I felt that everything in the culture encouraged me and in my job encouraged me to be a martyr for my work. And I, you know, I drank the Kool-Aid on that one. <laughs> 
<laughs> I, uh, I hear that one. I, I think that a lot of us who present as female, um, especially those of us of, of certain generations that were told that we were supposed to do everything, like everything, like be the perfect parent and carry the emotional load of parenting and all the everything up until bedtime and then also supposed to quote unquote kill it at work and be this great friend daughter sister um and the emotional load is is very heavy and was at least as far as i i my experience and women i know and people who present as female that i know that's really placed on those shoulders often how were you able to say it's enough or just it sounds like you had a very extreme experience um with your body telling you it was more than enough. Yeah, I called it my overdue notice from God. <laughs> <laughs> Little pebbles, then rocks, then bricks, then boulders. <laughs> oh, um, I mean, it's a huge question. So I'm old enough that I uh, was able to be, I was in a women's studies class in UC Berkeley in 1979 which was just amazing. People would, you basically, it was a class of 300, so people would just jump to their feet and um, sort of stand and deliver. Like, you know, that was that was the phrase from a, the Wells Fargo train when it was robbed, stand and deliver. <laughs> so, um, but the idea was that we would have state-supported child care. I mean, I thought by now all these things would be true, right? We oh, had, my God. Like, when we, yeah, we need women to build, you know, bombs. We had it. So we would have state-supported child care, we would have job flexibility, we would have job shares, we would have um, health care, maternity leave. Um, I didn't even have maternity leave with my first child. I was back in the classroom two weeks after he was born because the um, Clinton Family Leave Act it was prior to the Clinton Family Leave Act. Oh my gosh. So that yes. was the beginning of the kind of strain I put on my body. Right, I, didn't, I went without sleep for ten years. I'm sure you know that contributed. Um, I think that the notion now that's put out is an apolitical one, which is if we could just find the right work-life balance. Oh my gosh! <laughs> if we could just juggle things, if we could just somehow we just juggle things enough, right? If you just eat your meals over the sink and then <laughs> while you're doing squats, you should also be doing while squats you're while you're eating over the sink and. <laughs> Oh gosh! <laughs> While you're at the stoplight, do your kegels and uh. yeah, multitask yourself. Multitasking causes so much anxiety. I had to give it up, you know. Um, and so, I think we're being sold a bill of goods that 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 this it's apolitical to say if I just adjust my life enough, I'll get this work life balance thing together because the system is not supporting women. The curve. You know, we the male career curve comes in the prime childbearing years, right? Mm -hmm. But without the maternity leave, without the state-supported child care, we are not um, making it an equal playing field. So it's also yes, so screwed for men as good. well. My husband wanted to be home with my yes. daughter. He would actually be a way better stay-at-home parent than I ever have been. Um, he's really good at it. Fair I enough. am not so good yeah. at it. But he would have loved yeah, to have had like month or two months to stay home with her but because he wasn't the one who actively pushed her out he had to be back at work within like a, a week it was insane it's so it's heartbreaking for I know. everyone it is it is heartbreaking for men as well yeah and and um now for chronic illness, sharing you know, that. everything that we're discussing is also so true for both for like everyone who has chronic illness in the we don't have here here in the United States we don't have a lot of sick leave and if you do not work for a larger company you have no promise of sick leave at all so even if you're working 80 hours a week as a house cleaner or as um, as someone in a smaller company you wouldn't have the sick leave that's even promised by the Clinton Family Leave Act that happened I think in the 90s right that was a 90s thing. Yes, because I didn't have it in 91, and I can look it up, but I think it was 95, yeah. Yeah, I remember being in high school-ish when that came through, mm -hmm. and I was, like, shocked because I was a teenager, and I thought, of course, I mean, this this is supposed to be a pretty awesome country in a lot of ways. Of course people are <laughs> able to take time off to take care of a sick child or a sick parent or to be sick themselves. Mm -hmm. And even now, like, my friends who are teachers, they'll... Um, they'll save up their sick leave for a friend who has cancer so that that person can get their treatment or save up for a spouse of a cancer 
patients so that they can take their spouse to chemotherapy. Like, this is not dystopian society. This is right now. This is not fiction. It's crazy to me. And the things that we're still yeah, fighting and, for. Yeah, and why is there more fiction that is, I mean, this book and it's, is looking at all those pressures, you know, the medical pressures, you know, prescription costs, uh, medical leave. I mean, she's she's at the end of a medical leave wondering if she's going to be able to, you know, how, what's going to happen. She has to go back, you know, she has to go back to work. Um, I'm so, dying to read this book, by the way. I just, like, it's it's my worst nightmare. Is like, I'm so sick, and then I'm like, oh my gosh, what happens if the kids get sick? What My father's sick, but what happens if my mom's too sick? And, like, it's this is a, a trifecta of chaos for this woman, Maeve. Yeah, thank you. I like that expression, trifecta of chaos. I think it's interesting. Um, I used to listen to Elizabeth Warren's lectures mm. when she was still at Harvard because she studied the economics of the American family. And one of the things that she didn't, you know, we're not going to idealize the 1950s at all because that kind of nostalgia really belongs to middle-class white people. But, um, <laughs> yes, for a very specific did, group. <laughs> yeah. One thing that you did have is that when you, when you could have one wage earner, mm -hmm. right, support a family, yes. that meant that you had somebody at home if there, if there were a crisis, you know, of illness or affliction of some kind, you had somebody you could send out into the workforce, right? Because both people weren't already tapped out completely in, in, in the workforce. So um, we, don't have, we don't have any reserves. We're running without a contingency plan in families. We're running without reserves. Um, and because we don't live oftentimes near extended family, mm. um, we don't have that. We don't have that backup. I think it's interesting. I mean, people are living more in more co-op housing styles, you know. And I think, um, in my experience, the nuclear family was a fairly punishing structure. <laughs> so I'd say that, but but there is a woman anthropologist Helen Fisher who's been talking a lot about what she calls the association, where people are. Um, making really family out of large networks of friends. Oh yes. And until our until our our social structures change to take care of people, we really kind of have to do this. But I I tell people I say you know this we really have to question what the American dream has been that it's you know the nuclear family in in a in a large house. I think. Anything that could have at that time when I was climbing my way to tenure as a professor, anything that would have um, helped share the parenting, you know. Mm. My mom kind of grew up, I grew up in a neighborhood with a bunch of single moms and the kids all kind of ran around free like a tribe. <laughs> it was great. I hear that one, yes. <laughs> in and out of each other's houses and they got fed and, you know, but, but I didn't have that. I, I felt the isolation of of um, trying to um, live up to some leave it to beaver model that I had internalized. And is that something, is that how space affects Maeve? Is this like a microcosm and a pressure cooker of a certain amount of space without the outside support? Yes, she's right. She's, when you're ill, you're home. Mm. And, you know, it's, it's really, yeah. And there's that period, right, yeah, where she and her children are trying to adjust together inside the house. Um, the books I did find, there are very few on parenting with illness. Their advice was sort of, well, if you tell your child that their routines aren't going to change and that mommy's going to get better and, you know, that they'll be reasonable like, <laughs> and helpful. It's like, who, where, what planet are we on? These reasonable little, like they're little tiny adults. You know, my kids, they were frightened. I did my best to reassure them, but they wanted to provoke me until I got out of bed. You know, they were, <laughs> they fought all the time. <laughs> but if mom jumped out of bed and started yelling, then they were reassured that things were going to be okay. <laughs> and it's also the assumption that the parent is going to get better. That, And so, like, right. yeah. So how, right. throughout the book, how did the, the coping mechanisms change in the family structure? 
Well, I'll, I'll reel back first to the first thing, which is that one of the reasons that I included the stories about my friend with MS who didn't get better, who died, is because um, I I wanted that dark. I wanted that that shadow in the book that we live with, that illness brings us closer to mortality. Uh, I didn't want to whitewash that. Um, how does it change over time with the kids? Um, well, and they react very differently, right? Um, the son is, um, he's very attentive and attuned to his mother's illness. Um, at the same time, you know, there's a point where he flops onto her bed and, and tells her that if she just smokes his weed, everything will be fine. <laughs> Good, if only. I mean, <laughs> so, you know, he's, of course, he's self-absorbed. He's a teenager, and and, and he's you know he's, so he's but but he but he's he's sweet, and you know in later life, my my own son, my real son, um, had a, a girlfriend who was in um, kidney failure, and he really took care of her for a couple years. Um, that was a big love, and it was interesting to me um, that he was able to give that, and he had he had developed that degree of empathy. Um, my daughter, you know, the, and the daughter in the book's reaction in many ways is she can't, she needs her mother to be a foundation. She can't afford the mother to be unstable, right? So she doesn't have much empathy for the mom. Um, she's pretty tough on her because she's too afraid. And, you know, as they get older, you see um, there's a story called self-defense where the mother and daughter go to a self-defense class. And um, any time that the mother demonstrates strength, right, she gets tremendous rewards for, from her daughter. You know, both of my kids, the danger as being a parent alone and being sick with kids is that you're turning to the kids and saying, I don't feel well. I'm sick. Help me. Right? That's so frightening for them. They don't want to hear that. My kids both told me, they go, just tell us what to do. You know, go walk the dog. Don't tell us how you feel. I had to learn that. You know, I mean, there, there are, of course, things I would like to have done better, um, but I just didn't have a roadmap. I didn't have any instructions for living at that point, so and I, you... that's part of why I wrote the book. <laughs> um, I, I absolutely love that. That's always what I've, I and I've taught my kids to do, is that you take the, the negative and you turn it into art or an expression, because it, it's yeah. just the only way that... That I can filter. How how do you protect yourself from a lack of empathy, especially from those that you're you're counting on? And that I, I I just I can only imagine how hard I would feel if I got that from my kids. I'm just wondering how you protected yourself from that. Um. Well, um, I had some friends, and they saw that I had a, a greater need for support. Um. There were no parenting support classes. I just recently found out that there's a, the Chronic Pain Center of Seattle offers parenting classes. I'm like, oh no, wow. only 15 years too late. <laughs> so helpful that would have been. <laughs> I tell other people because some of them are online. You can do some of them online. They have support class, support groups. And um, so I did, um, though, find um, – I, I, I went to a mindfulness class. That helped me a lot. Um, a wonderful woman there, a uh, wife, a woman who told me, she said, Kate, sometimes things need to fall apart, right? And I've been holding on, just to, trying to keep everything together all the time. Um, so that was really helpful to me. Another time my, my brother came over and I was just so overwhelmed and I was in tears. And he said, make a list of all the things that you have to do. And he said, he said, now let's cross off everything where you can disappoint someone. He said, go ahead and disappoint someone. Oh, my God. <laughs> the bumper sticker that says, go ahead and disappoint someone. So that became a kind of mantra, you know? <laughs> that was like a physical punch on the solar plexus. <laughs> it's just, yeah, it's hard for women to do. I, hard for a lot of us. Yeah, like that seems to be like the ultimate fear of like, why a lot of us don't do anything or why we wouldn't do anything or push ourselves to try certain things is that fear of disappointing. Like, you know, the get better, why don't you feel better? And then just working so hard to even just 
put on the facade of get feeling better just to not disappoint others. Well, and overexerting yourself, and then you end up you end up sick, and then the people who love you know I'm 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 extended too far at work, and so now I'm not in good shape at home with my kids, and um, yeah, that's that. Um, I mean, I. I, I had to learn to not emotionally need my kids. I really had to get those needs met. Fortunately, I, I did remarry, you know. I did um, um, somebody I already had known for a couple decades. It was in my life. We'd known each other a long time. And um, so um, when we got together, I felt like, oh, I, I really did have somebody who had my back. Um, he's unusual. Uh, my husband's family's from Latvia. And so that's this little country that was first, you know, rolled over by the Germans and then occupied by Russia for 50 years. Um, so his expectations um, about suffering are different than most Ooh. Americans. He expects life to offer up. <laughs> He's got a nice, dark Eastern European view. Uh, some suffering. And he accepts a lot. And, um, uh, and when we married, yeah, when we married in, in 2015, I think that's when I finally began to believe that he wouldn't leave me. Um, that he would stay with me. And I think that that settled things down for my children as well as for me, you know. So that, that, that's the effect of love that can be quite profound. Um, but I also, you know, the fear of, of somebody not staying with you and if they see that side of you when you really get sick. You know, he went to the hospital with me during one flare-up and, um, you know, I wrote a story called um, Who Will Love Me Now? It's not a story, it's a chapter of the book, Who Will Love Me Now? And it's very much um, a couple and the woman's a whole kind of underground river of fear when she's out of remission about what's going to happen with the relationship. That, um, that is one of the most common questions that, that we get asked in our monthly segment with, um, with our sex therapist is like, so <laughs> what are my chances of finding a partner? Great, actually. Uh, mm -hmm. yeah, thank you. <laughs> um, but it is such a concern for a lot of us. Like how, how many of our cards do we show and when? And I think it also goes back to if you're a parent and with chronic illness is the fear of the child of, do I have this responsibility to my parents yes. that I'll be taking care of them? And that's a, a big thing. As you're right, like in the United States, there's such an expectation of what adulthood will look like for children, and it's very much not including taking care of, of parents, or in other cultures, that's actually something that's built into a culture. So it gets very confusing, I think, for, for at least for my teenagers, like, what's, mm -hmm. what's expected here? <laughs> how do I plan my life? Well, I, right. Are you a factor in how I plan that life? And that's, that's such a, a question mark. Uh, you had answered a question, and I would love to touch on it. I, if you do not want to talk about this, just raise up your hand. I'll, I'll switch over to a different topic. But you mm -hmm. talked about um, what you're afraid to tell people in your life, and it's about mental health and um, and a bridge. Did you want to talk about that, or should we walk away from that? Um, well, no, you don't have to walk away from it. Um, are we talking about it within my own family, the mental health issues in my own family? Um, yourself in particular. Uh, I don't want to necessarily go on to someone else's story if it doesn't. It's not like what we're talking about just for yourself. But you brought up like some really great. Um, it, it was a, you're so obviously a writer. Please go over to <laughs> to the show notes. These are beautifully written answers. Um, oh, I I don't know where my show notes are. So oh, you don't have to. I'm the one who has them. <laughs> all Thank all you. set up. Um, well, give me give me a prompt. <laughs> uh, I will I will absolutely do that. Um, you're talking more of a, a fantasy, not actually like a plan of doing something um, of self harm, but just more of a fantasy of it. And it was it's something that hit home really deeply for. Or for at least for myself yeah. and for other people I've talked to about it's not a plan I'm not gonna do this but but it's a thought it's and it's it's a thought it. it's a thought I know no when things get really things have gotten dark mm -hmm. and hard and um, I really can't you know I realize that too in my relationship to my to my husband that you know if we fight or, you know, there's just this person who's, I mean, right now I've got my 84-year-old mother lives down the street from me, so I'm taking care of her. There's never been a time, you know, my father died, but there's never been a time when I, uh, you know, I'm, I'm ill and I'm still taking care of other people. 
And so, um, you know, my backup is really important to me. So I, I have to be um, a good communicator because I can't afford to be at odds with the people I love. That is really something that will, you know, kick me down the stairs into the basement. And um, in that dark time, um, yes, I have, uh, I have a fantasy. Um, it's interesting. Um, Deception passes this beautiful bridge, on it, and people have over 500 people have jumped off of it. And, um, but it's that, you know, I love water and sometimes I'll fantasize about that release of letting go and being, you know, the air falling flight, all of those things. Um, but I distinguish that it's not suicidal ideation, right? It's an interesting question. I called, I have a best friend and I call her up and I'll say, I have that dying feeling again. (laughs) She says, you're not suicidal. You're just having a dying feeling. I'm like, you're right. Right now, the way I'm taking pressure off of myself is by, and I looked at it and I realized it's kind of a Buddhist uh, shortcut to equanimity, right? That sense of um, the impermanence of time. It's the way you feel when you're close to the ocean or if you're standing in front of some sort of geologic magnificence that makes you realize that we're just this little tiny skip in time, right? So then all of your problems shrink down in the face of that. And so for me, if I have that image, which is a dark image, and I, and I, you know, I wouldn't, um, I don't make light of that, but it isn't suicidal ideation. I don't have a plan. I would never do that to my kids. <laughs> you know, I like my life. I know these feelings will pass. But I think, you know, I remember once being so ill, and I went to the Crohn's and Colitis Foundation Network, and they had this woman, she had videos, right, about how to live with Crohn's. And she was so great. I lay in bed and watched 12 videos a day <laughs> of this woman. And I wanted to say, you saved me. Thank you. You know, and so in your kindness to others, you you never know um, how much you've lifted somebody else up. And so that um, that's another reason why I have a lot of faith in the kindness of people. But, um, yeah, thank you. I don't mind talking about that. I, I hope that that's not triggering for anybody. I, I will put um, but a I, triggering warning yeah. on the, the, um, the start of this. And also we'll have a suicide help hotline number um, at the top of our show notes. And um, mm-hmm. I just wanted to honor that. Unless you want to keep it out, it's fine. But, <laughs> but, you know, I mean, I did have my college roommate jump. One of my college roommates jumped off the Golden Gate Bridge. And, and I was really marked by that. That's one of the suicides in my own life. And, um, again, as I know, the rate of suicide is high, high in veterans. Um, you know, I'm all about uh, – I'm, I'm not sure how to say this, but I mean, I, 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 I feel such deep joy and satisfaction in my life. And I live for meaning and I live for connection um, to other people. And um, for me, storytelling isn't, it's not entertainment, it's not diversion. It's a way we perceive the world. It's a way we live in the world. You know, your life is your story, you know, that you're creating. And that's really a sacred thing to me. So, um, I just say these things with, um, I hope some care, um, and, uh, some caution. I, um, have nothing to say that could even hold up to that statement except thank you. And <laughs> as you to edit that statement out too. I don't care. I would no, rather you know, not, I, if you don't mind. Um, I just, I really wanted to honor what you had said because, I personally have those feelings a lot and it's not a suicidal feeling. It's more of the staring into the void and like, um, I don't know if you watched, uh, orange is the new black, but this last season mm-hmm. they had, and I won't spoil this for anyone. If you haven't watched it yet, I promise this is not a spoiler, but there's a character who has been a soldier and has PTSD and the explanation of self harm <laughs> as being a way that there's this big, huge thing that's happening in 
mind and body that's not visible outward. And so this is a mark. This is where I show that something bad happened so that I can justify the, the internal. Um, and I feel like a lot of those times where I personally have those feelings of like staring into the void that, that trigger like, oh, that, that would be a release. I feel like that's almost like the, like there, there's the, the bad thing I can point to. So I really wanted to like honor what you said and show the distinction between suicidal and, and this like, this moment, because I think there's, there's not anyone talking about that. And there's a distinction. I'm so glad you're <laughs> so eloquent in how you said that. And I just uh, want to um, say one last thing, which is I think that you're one of the most kind and empathetic people. And a lot of your kindness and empathy is in your ability to share bravely your experiences. And that is a vulnerability and the kindness and that vulnerability to really um, share yourself in your books and and definitely in your, your Red Badge project. That is a gorgeous, gorgeous thing. I will have a link to your Red Badge project as well in the show notes. Um, is there anything yeah. else you want to, to cover before we sign off? Um, yeah, that's a, that's a, I, I, I think that, um, one of the things that I know that leads people to darkness in, in my studies of, um, uh, it's kind of funny, you know, I've had a sabbatical and I spent the last nine months meeting, reading military memoirs and illness memoirs and novels. <laughs> So I know I'm like, wow, time to come up for a breather here. But but it's been fascinating. It's been really fascinating. And one of the things that I learned, um, and I, his name is not coming to me right now, but it was a study um, uh, of the conditions uh, out of which people do commit suicide. And one of those things is when people feel profoundly thwarted in their desire to belong, right? And so profoundly thwarted in their desire to belong. Um, and the other thing, oddly enough, is that people have to have some practice in a self-harm because it lowers the firewalls, I mean, it, it lowers the thresholds. And so that, that that's just interesting to know. But, but that thwarted sense of belonging, what you're doing, the work that you're doing, um, you know, coming, being able to come and listen to your podcast when I was feeling low, um, it's huge. It's huge, and it's important, and um, and you can't know even the reverberations of it. But I, I assure you that um, they're broad, and they make a tremendous difference in people's lives. So thank you. Well, uh, thank you for making my entire year with that. I <laughs> deeply appreciate that. <laughs> Can I tell you how many times this podcast is almost signed off because I've just been too sick to run it? So. Um, Thank you for that so much. Thank you. Thank you for your courage and stamina to keep um, it going. So, I don't yeah. have the stamina to keep going. So thank you, Eva, for stepping in and taking half the workload. Um, so all of you uh, who uh, <laughs> are grateful for this to keep going, uh, give some huge thanks out to Eva, who has turned out to be a huge rock star. Um, wonderful. Thank you so much mm -hmm. for coming on the podcast. I, thank you for reaching out and being here. I, I have deeply enjoyed this Um and all of your, your incredibly open sharing. Um, for everyone who's listening, um, this is a pretty heavy way to end. I don't usually end this heavy, but I will because it's just too beautiful to like try to figure out something mm. else for me to say. Um, but everyone who's listening, uh, we care about you. We really do, and you matter, and you're important. And if you are hitting the end of your rope, I will have some, some resources. If you know resources I do not, please email me. I will put these up, um, but you matter. We care. You are absolutely seen and heard. Please get help that you need or want. You deserve it. That is very important. So we will sign off now with our usual be kind. Thank you. Uh, I concur. <laughs> we, we concur. You absolutely matter. Um, so be kind, be gentle, and be a badass. This is a, a really crazy wild time in our history right now all over the globe. So we just really need to, those three words are going to be very important, being kind, being gentle, and we absolutely still have to be badasses. This is important. All right. Thanks, everyone. Have a great week. Um, and hopefully, uh, yeah, next week will be Eva, so you'll get to see her. Take okay. care. Thank you so much. <laughs>